is Kilimanjaro Safaris. My name is Clay. I'm your game driver for your photo safari through the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. Game spotting guides are overhead. We put five of them up there. They're going to help you identify any animals you see. Don't worry, I'll help you spot the animals. You can take all the photos you'd like. I need you to stay seated. That way nobody gets hurt and everybody around you can see. Use the wrist strap or neck strap that came with your camera. Keep your hands and arms inside the truck. The reserve won't allow me to get out of the cab, so we're not going to be stopping to pick up anything that falls overboard. Cameras, hats, water bottles, sunglasses, cell phones. Hold on tight to your valuables. Still down by your feet. If you drop something overboard, we'll make every effort to get it back for you, but in all fairness, it's probably not going to look like it did before you dropped it. And we're going to start our adventure in the Little Aturi Forest. Equatorial rainforest, low canopy, thick underbrush. Animals well adapted to live here. They roam freely. They can be on either side of the road. Sometimes they're in the road. That's always fun. You'll notice that most of the animals that live in the forest have got stripes on their body. Stripes plus the filtered light from overhead mutes the shape of the animal, helps them blend into their surroundings. They evade predators more effectively that way. This guy must be on the three-week tour. He sure is taking his time. Yeah, I'm going to let, wait for him to get out of the way. He came a long way to see the animals. I don't yeah, think you want to take pictures of the rear end of a truckload of tourists, although I could be wrong. All right, twin day. That means let's go. I'm going to copy in the bushes to the right. Whether or not she comes out remains to be seen. Keep your fingers crossed. Right up along the bamboo fence, there's a little guy sitting under the tree to your right. He's called a tweaker. Tweakers are antelope. His name translates to English as diver. He's got a yellow stripe on his back that you can't see because of the tree, but when he gets scared, that yellow stripe stands up. He lets up a, lets out a fierce scream. He dives nose first in the bushes. You can see one of the okapi, dark brown body, striped legs, partially concealed in the bushes. They're very shy. They weren't identified in the wild until 1901. Yeah. see me? The uh, stripes help them to see each other when they're running through the forest. Otherwise, those stripes act as camouflage. They're not related to the zebra. We don't get a very good look at the okapi, but if you look at the game guide overhead, you'll see that the okapi has a long neck and an elongated jaw. You're actually looking at the only relative of the giraffe. If you want to learn more about the okapi, there's an observation line on the walkway in Pagani Forest, you spend as much time there as you'd like. Morning hall is quiet. Most of the animals were here at sunrise. They take refuge in the forest during the day. They come back and drink again under cover darkness tonight. The big black and white bird to your right, this is a saddle-built stork. I want you to look very carefully. This bird is sitting on its knees. Its knees hinge forward. Its little pink feet are out in front of it. Here's his girlfriend up on the hill. When they stand up, they're five feet tall. They're the tallest stork in Africa. The wingspan's about eight feet. They're working on a nest up on the hill. This pair hatched out their first chick earlier this year, and they will stay together for life. We've got greater kudu in directly in front of us. Greater kudu or tan with white, no horns. These are girls. Look at the size of the ears. This is a fringe antelope. They live on the edge of the forest. They go back and forth between the grasslands and the woods. When they grow up, they'll be the second tallest antelope in this reserve. They'll weigh about 400 pounds each. The rust-colored animal is a little baby bongo. Yeah, the bongo are a forest-dwelling antelope. Here comes the rest of the bongo herd in front of us. The horns take back over their head at the perfect angle, and that way they move very quickly and quietly through the underbrush. These are not adults. Uh, these animals have all been born within the last year. The adult horns are about 24 inches long. So these guys are probably only about eight or nine months old. Yeah, the catering truck is here. That's why they're all going to check it out. <laughs> Nothing like a free meal in the middle of the day. Right now we're going to head towards Safi River. Let's see if we can find some hippopotamus for you. The Safi River has been the home of a pretty good sized herd of Nile hippo for as long as I can remember. 
We will ford the river. That means you get two chances to look for hippos. Your best photo is more than likely going to be on the left, but your first look for a hippo is going to be on the right. Hippopotamus is a Greek word. In English, it means river horse. They spend most of their day either in or very near the water. Hippos depend on the water to keep their body temperature down, to support their weight, to protect them from sunburn. The bad news, they can hold their breath for more than eight minutes at a time. So let's get ready to look on the left here. Here's a hippo right down here, submerged. The island is occupied, look at all of them up here, occupied by the big back pelican. The pelicans are endangered. The good news is they love it here. They've nested on this island for the last six years. There's been lots of baby pelicans born there. Here's the hippos. The hippopotamus are quite social. They hang out in groups that are called bloats or herds. There's one on the bottom. You gotta look for the shadows on the bottom. They really don't know how to swim. They just hold their breath and they bounce along on the bottom. They are negatively buoyant. Eventually they sink, but they float a lot. Yeah, there's several of them down there. They come out of the water at night. That's when they feed. They feed under cover of darkness. Their body stays cool and they don't sunburn. And a typical hippopotamus will eat 150 pounds of grass overnight. First thing in the morning, right back into the river. Those are crocodiles to your left. Nile crocodiles are bigger than American alligators. They're swimming in the water directly beneath the bridge, so you guys need to stay seated back there because nobody's going down there to help you. These crocs can reach 20 feet long and weigh 2,000 pounds. Most of the crocs you see today are between 11 and 14 feet in length, weighing between 400 and 900 pounds. They don't move much. Very slow metabolism. They lie motionless much of the day. They let the sun warm up their body. They allow their prey to walk right up to them. Their jaws can crush bone. The crocodile snaps his jaws shut. They'll generate about 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. So, uh, you know, just don't get too close because if they get a hold of you, they're not very likely to let go. If we're coming out of the forest, you're going to start to see grassland to your left. There it is. These are the grasslands of Eastern Africa, extending north and south for hundreds of miles. This is a very different ecosystem than the woods we're just in. There are all different animals living out there. It is difficult to see them from here on the overlook. There's a holy cow whale. So we're going down the floor of the sea. There's a giraffe sitting down out there, too. We're going down the floor of the savanna to get a look around, eventually heading due east toward elephant country. And hopefully we'll get into the elephant country before sundown. And just because you can't see the animals from the overlook doesn't mean they're not here. They've lived here for tens of thousands of years, and they do adapt to their environment. Those are water buck out here to the right. Right front, kind of a grayish brown with a white ring around there behind. The common water buck spends most of his adult life living near marshy watery environments. They don't migrate, they use water to escape predators. Their body secretes an oily fluid, they go swimming up to their neck, they won't even get wet. The problem? The oily fluid, it has a rather peculiar odor. And unless you're another water buck, you're not going to like the way they smell. The male has horns, the females do not. There's one of the girls sitting down. There we go, those are common water buck. They're kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of the savanna because they get no respect. There's an eland over here to your left. There's an eland sitting under the bushes. There's another one back here by the water. The eland are the largest antelope out here. These are girls, you go stand next to them. They're five feet tall at the shoulder. They weigh about 900 pounds each, and yet they are capable of jumping six to eight feet vertically, so it's a good thing they're not along the road. Elan are herbivores. They're not likely to eat you, but uh, they're curious enough to jump in the truck. They'll sniff you like you jump down. They are so big that nobody messes with them, so they got a pretty good disposition. See the giraffe out there? Those are wildebeest down there. We can head that direction. There's a couple of different giraffe species living in this part of the reserve. Hopefully we get close enough to them you can learn how to tell them apart. It's not particularly difficult. Uh, the big white horns on the roan cow, that's an Ancoli cow. Uh, they're the only domesticated animal that you will see on the entire trip today. 
Look at all the giraffe, wow. The Ancoli live side by side with the wild animals, but uh, they've been domesticated here for over 2,000 years. The Ancoli are very valuable to the Watusi tribe who consider them property and breed them for their coat, their horns. They uh, train them and they improve their social standing that way. Those horns can reach six feet long. These cows are a solid roan color that makes them very valuable. If they were spotted with white, they would not be particularly valuable to anybody. The wildebeest will migrate in the dry season, but not now. No, lots of grass, plenty of water, no need for migration. They got everything they need. Wildebeest from Southern Africa is a word that means wild beast. They're named for their black nose and their bulging eyes. Here in East Africa, we call them new. It's spelled G-N-U, and they get that name because it mimics the noises they make when they migrate. Look at all the giraffe. The two giraffe up on the hill, right in front of the palm tree, one sitting, one standing, they are reticulated giraffe. Reticulated giraffe are the most common, and they look like somebody threw a white net over their body. Their stripes are regular and repeating. The other giraffe are Maasai giraffe. The Maasai are pretty rare, one of the two or three rarest. Their stripes are irregular and disorganized. It's very unusual to see a giraffe sitting. It takes a long time to stretch those legs out. <laughs> So they got to be pretty confident there's no predators nearby. They're quite vulnerable when they sit like that. Here's another Ancoli. There's a small group of sable antelope up there on the ridge, partially concealed to the right of the tree stump. Dark brown, white stripes. The uh, sable antelope are used on the logo of the reserve. Those horns can reach more than 50 inches long. The sables, unfortunately, have one of the worst dispositions out here. They're cranky, they're aggressive, and that's a bad combination, so we usually just leave them alone. There's an opening in the grass coming up here on the right. You should be able to look back and see some of these animals. There's a, that's a Maasai giraffe. You can get a better look at the sable antelope out there. Lots of giraffe out there. The giraffes spend most of their day either eating or looking for food. About 16 hours, as a matter of fact. They have the same number of vertebrae in their neck that we have, seven. This is, the bones are very big, they're not very flexible, and it is very difficult for a giraffe to bend over and touch the ground. They have to spread their front legs apart, they lower the whole front portion of their body. That's how they get down to the ground, so that's why they've adapted to eating the leaves out of the tops of the trees, because they're almost impossible to attack if you're a predator if they're standing up. Predators go after them when they're bent over, when they're sitting down. Water hole looks pretty quiet. Looks like the elephants might have made a deposit over there today. Monkey point to your left. Here's a mandrel monkey moving through the rocks back here. You gotta look carefully. The mandrels are gray, a little bit of white. They're very smart. They don't sit out in the open. So they're up in the back. See them. Here's another one. They only weigh about 25 pounds. Uh, they are Rafiki's relatives, sort of. Rafiki is different than any other mandrel. The uh, Disney animators took care of that, but they're kind of related. It's a long story. There's a bull elephant to your right. The bull elephant, he's a, there's an opening in the grass coming up here. He's a solitary creature. He's, he's not part of the elephant herd. He got kicked out of the herd by his mother when he reached physical maturity. He spends most of his adult life alone. The dirt on his back is sunscreen. His hide's pretty sensitive. You don't like to get sunburned. His mama taught him when he was a baby how to throw dirt on his back. He does it every single day. Now he's about 12 feet tall. He weighs over 11,000 pounds. And he's about 3,000 pounds bigger than the average female. He's a very aggressive, powerful animal. He can't be trusted with the calves. He'll hurt him if he plays with them. So bulls spend most of their adult life alone. He learns from the other bulls. He only goes back to the herd if he's invited. That's usually for baiting. Keep your fingers crossed. You might see him again. There's no opening of the grass here. Oh, there he goes. Yes. See him? Just catch a glimpse of him through there. We're going around to bypass him because he's got the road blocked. Yeah, there's no way up there. He's bigger than the truck. So we're going to go around and we're going to head for the river and see if we can catch up with the herd before the end of the day today. The uh, reserve's elephant herd has been quite active. We're pretty confident there's been at least six births here in the last 10 years. Might not sound like much, but remember, elephant gestation is 647 days. It takes
takes Mama almost 22 months to deliver for a cow. And the elephants come here to the clay pit about once a week, and you can see what they do. They dig their tusks in. The red clay is soft, it's chewy, and it's full of minerals that are missing from their vegetation diet. There's an elephant down to the left. So they break it loose in chunks. It's like eating a Flintstones vitamin. Here's one of the girls. Look at that aim. She used her trunk to put the dirt up there. Her aim's pretty good. When a baby elephant is born, it weighs between 200 and 300 pounds, so twins are pretty rare. They stay with their mothers till they reach physical maturity in their early teens. They can live to be 60 or 70 years old. There's another one of the adults out here to your left. We all do it, that's exactly right. The elephants do have a, a very inefficient digestive system, though. They only process about half of what they take in, and then the other half gets dumped back on the landscape. Here's the babies out here in front of us. Elephant calves enjoy the second longest childhood in the animal kingdom at between 11 to 13 years. Only a human has a longer childhood. This is the, the first animal by the tree is a calf, a little girl. She's about eight years old. This is a mature female, a mother of two. Right here, she's one of the smaller females. She weighs about 5,700 pounds. This is another little girl. This is her oldest. This is about a seven-year-old little girl. And then the two youngsters, a little boy and a little girl, three and a year and a half respectively. So these are four of the six calves. When they're not horsing around amongst themselves, they follow mama around, they mimic her behavior, and that's how they learn to act like an elephant. There's a giraffe on the hill to your right. This is the, this is the greater flamingo on the left. The greater flamingo is the tallest of the African flamingo species. Very, very pale pink, what little coloring they've got is hidden underneath their top feathers. Let's, oh, look at them go. The island's crowded, it's disorganized, they love it that way. They find safety and comfort that way. They do get on each other's nerves. Fights break out there all the time. It's the longest running soap opera on this event. <laughs> but the fights don't last long. They usually fight each other a couple of times. They go in different directions and they forget pretty quickly. White rhino. This is the larger of the two African rhino species. They are named for the shape of their mouth. They have a broad, flat lower lip. The Afrikaan word for wide, spelled V-I-T-E, pronounced bite, has been mistranslated. Their eyesight's horrible. Beyond 20 feet, they can't make out shapes, so watch those ears. They can't see us from there, but they can hear us, they can smell us, and since we didn't threaten them, and we're no threat to them, they're gonna ignore us. They've been rolling in the mud, they have sunburn problems just like the elephants. They roll in mud like this stuff over here. When it dries, it protects them from sunburn and insect bites. They are a tremendous conservation success story. They were nearly extinct 100 years ago. An international effort stopped the poaching. It took 100 years for the population to recover. Those are cheetah on the ridge to your left. Golden brown with dark spots, two of them. They're looking up the hill. They are capable of sprinting to more than 60 miles an hour. They are only able to maintain maximum running speed for about a quarter of a mile. Their bodies overheat. They're forced to slow down. Even though there are two of them sitting together, if they're hungry, they hunt individually. They hunt during the day, and cheetah has fabulous daytime eyesight. Not very likely. I guess extreme circumstances could exist, but not very likely. Well, they're going to be patient hunters. They have learned the hard way not to waste energy chasing the big animals. So they'll wait for the gazelles and the warthogs, which are two of their favorites. This rock formation is called a copy. It's an Afrikaan word. It's from the uh, South Africa K-O-P-J-E. And it uh, refers to the way the granite has apparently just popped out of the grassland. We're going to circle all the way around. Stay alert. Not unusual to see lions or leopards sleeping in rocks like this. 
the big cats, I do warn you, they are generally inactive during the day. There's another white rhino up on the hill to your right. Looks like been rolling, she's been rolling in the mud. Yeah, they're all over the place right now. Grant Zebra, save your, save your memory, we'll get closer to them. There's an ostrich down Boma Road to the right. That's the largest flightless bird. She's seven feet tall, she runs 40 miles an hour, but her eyes are so big they crowded out the brain. And she's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. She left her nest this morning after incubating the eggs all night. She can't find it. She's been looking for it all day. <laughs> True. She shares the nest with a couple of other girls. They take turns incubating the eggs. Otherwise, the eggs would be left unattended. Every day is Groundhog Day. There's a lion up here. Every day is Groundhog Day for the ostrich. Got to look carefully. Very difficult to see. And that's a male. Oh, there's two of them. The female is to the left. You can see her ear and a bit of her head. The male is to the right, and you see his mane, and they're both doing what lions do best. They're asleep. They get up the rocks because nobody can sneak up on them up there. They've got a full stomach. They're not interested in food. They just want to be left alone. They rest 18 to 20 hours a day. That is the warthog, the largest burrowing mammal. Here comes Bob. You ever heard the term hightail it out of here? That came from the pigs. When they get scared, they raise their tail as a warning. And they run with the tail raised, high tail out of here. They won't stray far from the burrow. They sense danger. They back into the burrow. They use those massive tusks to protect their family. They got stuck with the name Pumbaa after the Disney movie. That's Swahili. It means silly or foolish. They're neither. They're actually pretty smart. Here's the grand zebra. Here's the ostrich eggs to your left. There's the ostrich to your right. The grand zebra is a short-legged, wide-striped, pretty common plains of zebra. They are the lion's favorite food. Lions better be careful. Zebra will break a lion's jaw with a single kick. Where a horse or a cow has a hoof that's split up into a couple of pieces, the zebra's hoof is one piece and they pack quite a wallop. That's why the lions attack from the side and the rear. The zebras sense danger and they'll bunch up together. Their stripes will blend in and it'll confuse the lions and the leopards. They won't be able to tell the head or the tail or one from the other, slows them down just enough to let the zebras get away. And then a Magadi Glen. This is used in species survival research. Never quite sure what's going on here. They're always experimenting, looking for secondary habitats for some of these endangered animals. Look out here on the ridge left front. This is the Adax. The Adax would normally be found living in the arid deserts of North Africa. Their white coat allows them to reflect sunlight so they can stay cool. They have the unique ability to raise and lower their body temperature. It allows them to tolerate the intense heat on the desert floor. They go months at a time without drinking fresh water. They get all the fluid that they need from the roots of the grasses they chew on. Horns are pretty impressive. They're about three feet long, nice spiral. Very popular among sport hunters who have unfortunately almost wiped out the species. Our researchers tell us there's no more than about 300 up in the wild. Only about 1,500 on the entire planet. There are more Adax living today in Texas than live on the African continent. We've been pretty fortunate. We've seen animals from all over Africa. Some of them are struggling with a significant loss of habitat. They've lived here for thousands of years, but every year their range gets smaller. The human population is expanding. We are doing everything we can to minimize conflict between the animals and man. To be successful, well, we better do some more research. The more we learn about the animals and their habits, the better prepared we will be to provide for them in what inevitably will be a much smaller environment. Here in Harambe, our researchers study elephant vocalization. The elephants we saw talk to each other. They will trumpet warnings when they're scared, but they rumble otherwise. Elephant rumbling subsonic below our audible range. We can't hear it, but we can record it. Researchers follow the herd. They take notes on activities. They listen to their rumblings and try to figure out what the elephants are talking about. We've made some interesting discoveries. Barely scratched the surface. You want to get involved, folks? Learn all you can about your favorite animal. Find a conservation organization that reflects your values, I'm pretty sure, uh, that they would appreciate the help. This is the Warden Post. I'm going to drop you off here. You're just outside the village. I hope you enjoyed your support. I invite you to come again. You'll see something different on every